ask Phil Gilhood to, Gilhood to come on up here and uh, we're going to have a, a moment to pray and uh, ask Phil uh, to pray in particular for the nation of Ukraine. He and his family uh, spent years there and uh, so let me open that time in prayer and then uh, Phil's going to actually pray uh, the Lord's Prayer in the language of Ukraine, Ukrainian language this morning, and then also pray for that nation and for us. So let's pray. Our Father, uh, we, we know on our lips and we just proclaimed how great your love is for us. But Father, our our lives and our journey and the journey of those around us uh, sometimes Father uh, you seem far away and sometimes we don't know what you're doing as our family members and brothers and sisters go through difficult times. But Father, uh, we also proclaim today that you are our only true source that we can ever turn to in those moments. That you are the God who demonstrates great love. Father, for those who are with us today that are experiencing their own world being uh, tossed in the sea, I pray that you would uh, be their refuge, their shelter, their anchor. Father, for those that are here today who have close friendships around people around them who are going through difficult times, Father, Create in us, through your love, a desire and a willingness and a uh, ability to extend love to those and to be their friend and to help others uh, turn to you, to remind others of your goodness and of your love when often they can't see it through the clouds. Father, I pray. Pray your blessing today on John and Lindell. I thank you, Father, for uh, their, their love for you. And Father, I thank you that uh, you provide uh, medical care for Lynn that's close to where she lives. And uh, Father, we pray for your mercy in her life. We pray, Father, I pray that uh, if it would please you and bring you great glory that you would uh, heal her body from this cancer. I pray, Father, that the treatments would be effective and that the side effects would be minimal. Father, I pray for uh, Nellie Milburn, who lost her son this week. And I pray that you would please uh, allow her to find you in this moment. Give her a ability to think clearly and to respond to your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Continue as we continue praying for the situation in Ukraine. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter six, verse nine, if you'd like to follow along in English. And I invite you to consider um, that our Ukrainian brothers and sisters will likely be praying these very words. Oče naš, što je si na nebesah, nechaj svjatit se imja tvoje, nechaj pride carstvo tvoje, nechaj bude volja tvoja, jak na nebi, tak i na zemlji. Chleba našeho nastušného daj nám si hodný. 
I prosti nam dolhi naši, jak i mi prošćajemo zvinovacijam našim. I ne uvedi nas u vipropogovanja, ali vizvoli nas vid lukavoho. O Tvoje je carstvo i sila i slava na viki. Amin. Lord, our hearts are broken over the tragic war in Ukraine, and we come to you now, our holy, almighty God, knowing that you see, that you know, and that this grieves you more deeply than we can imagine. So we turn to you, Father, and ask that you would shelter Ukraine and her people in the shadow of your wings. May you be the source of comfort for grieving Ukrainian and Russian families, both who have lost loved ones in the tragedy of this war. O Christ, who binds our wounds, be their great healer. O Spirit, who enters every grief, intercede now for these hurting peoples in their broken lands. Be present in the midst of this far-reaching pain, O Lord, for we are reeling at the news of threat and loss of life, News of flourishing diminished, of individuals harmed, of pain imposed. Engage our imaginations and move our hearts to compassion that we would interact with these casualties, not as news stories or st statistics, but as our own flesh and blood, divine image bearers, irreplaceable individuals whose losses will leave gaping holes in homes, friendships, workplaces, churches, schools, organizations, and neighborhoods. Be merciful to those wounded. Be present with those bereaved. Be mighty among those afraid. You do not run from the chaos of this world, Father. Let us not do so either. We pray that you would be with all who move toward this need, those who offer aid and protection. Grant our government leaders wisdom, courage, vision, sympathy, and strength to serve with the humanity that ultimately flows from your heart. Console those who have labored long and sacrificed to serve Ukraine and Russia and their peoples. And we pray that you would arrest the hearts and stay the hands of all who even now are plotting further evil and violence. Turn them from hatred. Turn their hearts to you. You have declared yourself a father to the weak and fatherless. So may you now protect the most vulnerable, women and children and the elderly, the disabled and the targeted and the hated, and especially your beloved bride, our brothers and sisters in Jesus. Give them courage to stand and may they be multiplied. You alone have strength to carry these people. Carry them now, Lord. You alone have wisdom and power to heal the wounds of nations. Heal them now, Lord. Even in the shadow of such tragedy, let us not lose hope. Give us eyes to see the rapid movements of mercy rushing to fill these wounded spaces. Let us see in this the echoes of your own mercy and compassion, a picture of your kingdom coming on earth. We pray that your kingdom would come with great power, that your will would be done on earth, in Ukraine and in Russia, as it is in heaven. And so be merciful, O Lord. Bring many multitudes to yourself. Save, O God. Amen. Thank you. Well, good morning. This morning we're going to talk about mercy and compassion and uh, just one bit of information. Some of you are maybe anxious because you're holding on to your connection card or your benevolence offering or your offering for today. Hold on to that a little longer. We're going to uh, be taking up our offering near the close of the service just so you can relax. No one has blown it yet. <laughs> uh, and also, yeah, we got our tissues up here. I think Pastor Greg and I are both allergic to these plants up here or something because 
just get up here. And we both struggle with that. But uh, thanks for thanks for being with us. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew, Mark, Luke, the book of Luke, the third gospel, the third book into the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter ten, and uh, there's a a spot perhaps that you might want to use on your programs uh, to take a few notes this morning. So one of the uh, one of the characteristics of God's people over the uh, of God's people over the over the millennium has been mercy. Uh, it's been graciousness. It's been compassion, and uh, one of the uh, traits through the years that God has been uh, growing and developing in us here at Emmanuel Baptist Church uh, is that same trait. And we've got a ways to go yet in being merciful and compassionate and loving our neighbors. And it's right in our church mission statement to honor God and love people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. So this morning to kick off uh, this series leading up to our 75th anniversary, uh, we're going to talk about uh, having a heart of mercy. This week, uh, Bill Shaw and I uh, had the opportunity on uh, Wednesday to uh, spend a couple hours with Nellie Milburn. Uh, most of you have probably never met Nellie. Uh, some of you may know her son, Dondi, Donnie, Donald, Don. Uh, <laughs> he had all of those nicknames and names. And uh, uh, this past Monday evening, uh, Donnie passed away. And uh, he was at Hospitality Home here in Xenia. And uh, the last couple of visits that I had with him, uh, he was just so, so hard to understand. He could hardly speak, and he so badly wanted to. And uh, it was good for me to sit by his bed and talk with him about the things that we always talked about. And... Uh, He'd kind of have some expressions change on his face and he'd try to form words and it just wasn't happening very well and it was very frustrating. And uh, Then on Tuesday afternoon, I uh, went over by myself. That's why I needed reinforcements on Wednesday because it was too hard on Tuesday. <laughs> but I went over on Tuesday and, and uh, saw Nellie briefly, his mom, and She's in the same facility. They've been there. We're there together for about four years. And uh, went into his room, and I was going to look through a few things, and uh, just I couldn't do it. It's empty. Couldn't do it. So besides Bill, I called Janelle for reinforcements on Wednesday. And on Wednesday morning, uh, Janelle and I went over and spent about an hour and a half with Nellie talking about Don and his 56 years on this earth and stories and sifting through his belongings. And uh, then Janelle pushed Nellie in a wheelchair out the room and I had a average size box with the things that were left that maybe are worth keeping and I closed the door turned off the lights and it was just one of those moments that uh, I probably won't forget because Donnie was my friend and a friend of a lot of yours here and was one of the first people here on Sunday mornings so proud of making coffee and sitting out there and being our number one greeter unofficially and that's really okay to do around here. <laughs> and uh, so we're, uh, Nellie would like uh, us to do a service uh, 
here in the next couple of weeks in memorial service and uh, so we're, we're hoping to be able to do that to plan that and, uh, but that was uh, an event in the middle of my week that I guess I didn't see coming that God did and it came over the last in the middle of the last couple of weeks where I've been studying in Luke chapter 10 and reading about the parable of the Good Samaritan and uh, Jesus, the masterful storyteller, uh, tells a story that probably many of our children could be pretty good at just sharing. And it's not a very complicated story, but it's a powerful story. And it's a story that, it's interesting how these things that, it's only mentioned, the Good Samaritan's only mentioned in one gospel, book of Luke here, written nearly 2,000 years ago, and yet in our culture and around the world, the whole idea of a good Samaritan is, is we all know what it means. We all, we're familiar, many of us are familiar with Good Samaritan Hospital in Dayton. Uh, there's a Good Samaritan College of Nursing in Cincinnati. Good Samaritan Medical Center in Florida. Good Samaritan Health Center in Atlanta. We even have something in our, in our laws, the Good Samaritan Law. And how is it that just one story, one story is still something that is impacting culture? When we hear about being a good Samaritan, or that person was a good Samaritan, we immediately uh, understand what that means. From one story. It's amazing. So Luke chapter 10, if you would uh, turn there please, and uh, I just want to uh, read through the story that Jesus told starting in verse 30 and then we'll we'll uh, back up in the passage a little later Luke chapter 10 and verse 30 in reply Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers they stripped him of his clothes beat him and went away leaving him half dead <laughs> just all the imagery just in those first two sentences there. Uh, we don't know this man's name. We know that he was traveling. It says down. That's not talking about down south. That's talking about downhill. Uh, Jerusalem in the mountains. And the mountains and uh, Jericho down in the valley. The Jordan Valley near the Dead Sea. And uh, a windy, uh, dangerous path, road. Lots of twists and turns and lots of places historically where uh, it was dangerous to travel. And a man was traveling down from Jerusalem to Jericho, maybe a 15, 20 mile journey, when he was attacked by robbers. Uh, not a good day for him. <laughs> they didn't just take his money, they took his clothing of value. And then they weren't just satisfied with that. They beat him up and beat him up and beat him up and then left him lying there half dead. And Jesus brings his listeners right into this story of a man without a name just lying there edge of this road robbed beaten, and half dead. Verse 31. A priest happened to be going down the same road. The story that Jesus tells, here comes the, uh, the person who is perhaps serving regularly in the city of Jerusalem and maybe lives or is doing business in the city of Jericho. We don't know, but he's traveling down the same road. 
He's a man who should be familiar with God's laws, the practices of the temple. The priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Does that hurt a little bit? <laughs> At this point, there's no one else in the story but a half-dead, beaten man along the side of the road and a priest in his garb and his attire. And it wasn't like he didn't notice this guy. It says he saw him and then he went to the opposite side of the road. And he continued on his way. Verse 32. Jesus says, So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. A Levite, perhaps also a man who's known as one who assists in the duties of the temple, wasn't necessarily of the lineage of the priesthood of Aaron, but had important duties to do there in the temple. And he also happened to come to the place. He saw the man lying there, and he had the same response. He went as far as he could, opposite, away from the man lying there and continued on his way. What? Why? Why did they do that? Why in this story these two individuals who both had jobs and careers and a lineage of being in service to God in the temple. They saw a man in need and went on the other side of the road and kept going. We don't know exactly why, but I think maybe our own lives and our own human nature, we can speculate. This road's too dangerous for me to stop and help him. I better keep moving. <laughs> he might just be a decoy. I go over to help him and I'm going to get ambushed. I've got to get home. Someone really should stop and help them. <laughs> if I'm going to serve at the temple or if I'm going to whatever, I don't want to get my clothes dirty. I don't want to get involved. I don't know the first thing about first aid. It's a hopeless case. I'm sure he's going to die anyway. I'm in a hurry. I have things to do. No, I don't like the sight of blood. These needs are too great. There's no way I can meet them myself. I'm only one person. This job is too big. Let someone else do it. Oh, if others see me, maybe they'll think I'm the one that beat them up. I don't want to get involved in that. Huh, I can pray for him as I walk by. Ha, he brought it upon himself. He should have never been alone on this dangerous road. What was he thinking? Uh, he never asked for help. Not sure what these guys were thinking, but each of them, the priest and the Levite, saw a man in need. And they didn't respond with mercy and compassion. 
Instead, they kept going on their journey. We continue reading. But a Samaritan. Now, Jesus, uh, <laughs> with one word, speaking to a Jewish audience here, uh, they immediately had all sorts of images in their mind. A Samaritan. Okay. Uh, I don't understand this, and I'm not sure where in my culture background there's a similarity that's nearly as deep and strong as what this is about a Samaritan, but the Samaritans were uh, descendants of Jewish people that had intermarried with, with Gentiles and were no longer considered to be Jews. In fact, they had, they had, there no, was no hope for them. There was nothing good a Samaritan could ever do or become. And people traveled in Israel. They often avoided the Samaritan towns and traveled around the territory of Samaria just to avoid those people. And Jesus, with just this one word, says, well, to his Jewish audience, the one who you think is good for nothing, Listen to what happens. Verse 33, a Samaritan as he traveled. You know what? He was on his way somewhere too. I don't think, it doesn't say that he just was hanging out there as the good Samaritan in case someone gets in trouble. He was on a journey too. And he had places to go and he had things to do. And it says that the Samaritan as he traveled came where the man was and when he saw him he took pity on him. He had compassion on him. It's this word that uh, that that tries to to give us this idea of from his gut he was just moved with pity and compassion. In some places in the King James Bible and other translations might even say the bowels the bowels of mercy, right? Where where that. At one time, the belief was that within our bowels was where the deepest emotions lied in a person. I mean, we kind of laugh at that now, but it's our heart that's pumped and that we now say is the, the center of that. And we use the heart for all sorts of things. But at his deepest emotions, he saw him and he was moved with compassion. He took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. That took a lot of effort. It took a lot of time. It took a, an adjustment of his schedule. And he took care of him with him he was present with him and he spent the night because verse 35 the next day he took out two denarii two silver coins and he gave them to the innkeeper look after him he said and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have Then Jesus says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. In, uh, I don't know, it was January or, or February a year ago, 2021. Uh, our daughter-in-law, Hillary, was at Dayton Children's with our grandson, Enoch, as part of his six-week stay there that many of you prayed for and were a part of. And I believe it was on a Sunday that uh, Jared came back to his house to do laundry, to get some real food from their house, and to take it back to the hospital for Hillary and to probably anticipate spending another week there. I 
That's what they were in the midst of at that time. And on that afternoon, as Jared was driving, our son Jared was driving to Dayton on 35, uh, by the Smithville or Woodman exit, uh, he saw a car just a little bit in front of him go off the road and roll down the hill a couple of times and, and land upside down. And he had just done his laundry. His clothes were clean. And he had some warm food and was in a hurry to get to Dayton Children's Hospital to be with his wife and grandson. Places to be and really important things to do. And in that moment, in that moment, Jared decided to stop and pull off on the side of the road and hurry down the hill and wait there with those two individuals that were, were doing okay but trapped in their car and wait till help came. And he was there and an hour later, whenever it was, when he finally got to the food to Hillary and begged the clean clothes, you know what? That was an okay thing to do for Jared. And you know why he did it? Because God has created in him and is creating in him a heart of mercy and compassion. Glory to God. Because without God, we just miss those opportunities. And we will love and show compassion to people when it's convenient, when it's in our schedule, when we know what it's going to cost us, when we know what the parameters are, when we can define those boundaries and limits in our own terms, then it's okay to, to, to plan to have these times of showing mercy. But when it starts to cost us, that's when we need to rely on God to have done something in us. That our relationship with Him enables us to love the needy around us. All right. Here's another story, one I found. Once upon a time... A man fell into a pit and couldn't get himself out. A sensitive person came along and said, I feel for you down there. A practical person came along and said, I knew you were going to fall in sooner or later. A Pharisee said, only bad people fall into pits. A mathematician calculated how far he fell. A news reporter wanted an exclusive story on the pit. An IRS agent came along and asked if he was paying taxes for his pit. A self-pitying person said, you haven't seen anything until you've seen my pit. A mystic said, just imagine that you're not in the pit. An optimist said, things could be worse. A pessimist said, Things will get worse. <laughs> Jesus, seeing the man, took him by the hand and lifted him out of the pit. Of our three characters in the story, the thief, if you just want to summarize it really, really simply, the thief, the robbers, here was their attitude. They said, whatever you have, it's mine, I want it, and I'll take it. The priest and the Levite, as they walked by, in their actions, they said, what's mine is mine, and if you need it, you can't have it. And the good Samaritan, what's mine is yours, and if you need it, I will give it to you. What's mine is yours, and if you need it, I'll give it to you. So what's this story about? It's about love. It's about compassion. 
It's about too often, two characters, right? Too often, the two characters represent us, represent humanity. I thank Phil for being willing to lead us in prayer today. Your hearts ache when you read and see pictures from around the world. Does it cause you to stop and pray and think of ways to be involved and engaged and to support those that are trying to do ministry in difficult places around the world? So if you, uh, look at this passage again, it starts out with this question at the beginning, right there in the end of verse 29. This man asked Jesus, the expert of the law asked Jesus, who's my neighbor? And Jesus told the story, and then he switched the question. I don't know if you, you, you see this here, but it's worth noting. The man said, who's my neighbor? And then Jesus flipped it around and said to him at the end, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man? Not who's my neighbor, but which one acted neighborly? Which one demonstrated love? And the, the religious people would have been shocked that a Samaritan of all the people turned out to be the one who did good in this story. How can anything good come from a Samaritan? Would have been shocked about that. So now application, where can we turn to from this story? And What's the meaning of the parable? What's the meaning of it? It's so simple. so simple. But we love our neighbor. And who do we exclude from our love? Who do we, who do we exclude from stopping and helping? When is our agenda so important that when God brings to our awareness a need that we can meet. Can we stop? That's what the story's about. Will we do that? Some have combined, confined, uh, defined compassion as your hurt in my heart. Your hurt in my heart. And I'm going to listen and be aware long enough and know you well enough and be involved personally that your hurt enters into my heart. Not our head, not our eyes, but deep into our heart. Well, there's two reasons to show mercy. Uh, one is the Bible clearly teaches that God has been merciful to us. Well, there's hundreds and hundreds of verses that talk about God's mercy and love in the Old Testament and the New Testament, about His compassion, about His grace. Ephesians 2, verse 4 says, God's mercy is so abundant and His love for us is so great that while we were spiritually dead in disobedience, He brought us to life with Christ. It is by God's grace you have been saved. Because at one time, all of us who know, now know Jesus, at one time we were also laying on the side of the road, but we weren't half dead, we were dead dead. And God showed mercy. God wants me to act in the same way to other people. He's shown me mercy. 
Matthew 18 is the parable of a servant that was forgiven so much and then he went and throttled the guy that owed him a few pennies. What in the world? When you've been shown mercy, extend it. So one reason to stop and show mercy and have compassion is God's been merciful to you. Another reason, the second reason, is because God commands us to do it. Micah 6, 8, God has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. In Luke chapter 6, just a few pages earlier, the book of Luke, Luke chapter 6, verse 27, Jesus says, but to you who are listening, I say, these are the words of Jesus, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, Luke 6, 36. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. That's a command of Jesus. Our response, will we obey it or not? When Jesus says, be merciful. Be merciful. Who won't you help? Who don't you have time for? Who's beyond the reach of your love and your mercy? What's keeping you from stopping? God's heart is for the needy. <laughs> God's heart's for each one of us, the real needy. Is your heart for the needy? How can you accomplish this? How can you forgive the unforgivable? How can you love the one who you love to hate? Only by seeing first how much you've been forgiven and by seeing how much you have been loved. The story of the Good Samaritan is the story of Jesus. He's the one who has come and who has rescued you at a great personal cost. He is the Savior who saves. He has found you helpless. He has carried you to a place of safety. And now he is calling us to be Jesus to the world and showing mercy to those in need. In the end, we must recognize that even our righteous acts come as a result of God in us. We need to pray for God to change our hearts, to open our eyes, to cause us to stop when someone's in need. Alexander McLaren writes, the world would be, changed, would be a changed place if every Christian attended to the sorrows that are plain before him. Charles Wesley writes, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all times that you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Oh God, don't allow me to come into contact with anyone in need and leave him or her no better off than they were before I met them. the end of this parable when the man identified the neighbor as the one he showed mercy what did Jesus say go and do likewise not once but make this a pattern of your life of doing likewise if there's someone you know that's in need and you can help and be a neighbor and love them. And now we need to go to the uh, setting of this parable. So if you have your Bibles, go back up to uh, the beginning of this passage. I can find that page here. Verse 25 of Luke chapter 10. Because this is really the, the key takeaway is the second part. And the first 
takeaway that I just shared is consistent with God's teaching throughout the Bible of being merciful and compassion and commanding us to do that. But the real meaning of the parable is in this second part. Verse 25, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, there's an issue right there for an unbeliever, for a expert of the law. What do I do? Maybe you're familiar with it, but followers of Jesus don't come to Jesus by doing. They come to Jesus because of what he has done. And this expert of the law, this person who studied the Old Testament literature, came to Jesus and he said, what must I do to get eternal life? That's a great question. How can I get eternal life? What must I do isn't quite the right way to go about it, but Jesus, in his skill and wisdom, says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? This man answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and all your mind. Quoting from the Old Testament law, he would know that, the expert of the law. And love your neighbor as yourself. From Deuteronomy and Leviticus. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this continually, perfectly, and you'll have life. Now that's one of those spots where, whoa, what is Jesus saying here? Jesus says that if we follow the law, we'll have eternal life. If we follow the Ten Commandments, we'll have eternal life. He said, just the words of Jesus, do this and you'll have life. What is Jesus saying here? Jesus is actually revealing to this person that there's no way for a person to do that. It's impossible to follow the law perfectly. And Jesus is absolutely right. If there's anyone who can follow the law perfectly and has never sinned, then they will have eternal life and they can have a relationship with the Father but this man knew he couldn't do that, hadn't done that, hadn't obeyed it perfectly. And so then he says, verse 29, he wanted to justify himself. Why? Because he knew he wasn't right. So how can he be made right? Well, let's put some parameters around what it means to love my neighbor. And then maybe if we write it up correctly here, Jesus, you and I, as we negotiate this, then maybe I can check this off as loving my neighbor within these certain parameters. That kind of makes sense? Like, like, if I can make the law apply so that it works for me, so that I'm a winner, so that I'm right, so that I'm grading the test, I'm the answer key, then all's good with me and God, right? And that's when Jesus goes right into this story, and the man says, so who's my neighbor? How are you going to draw it up? How do you find this, Jesus? Let's talk about that. And then Jesus brings the good Samaritan in as being the good neighbor because he's the one that truly loved. And this man, if he had a heart that was sensitive, realized that at that point, he's not able to keep the law. And now what do I do? I need a savior. That's the purpose of the law, to reveal to us that, that we need help. Matthew 5, 18, this is the words of Jesus. You are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. It's a high standard. Matthew 5, 20, for I tell you, Jesus says that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Not perfect. And our our following of the law and doing of the law is nowhere nearly as, as, as deep as what these Pharisees and the people who, who committed their lives to doing it is. What do we do? 
And at that moment, that teacher of the law should have said, I need help. So if you're here and you've never, never given your life to say, I just, I need Jesus to help me. I need Jesus' forgiveness. I need a relationship with God. In a few moments, we're going to celebrate communion together, which is a reminder of that. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. What's it a reminder of? It's a reminder that we're not good enough. But that there was one, Jesus Christ, who was good enough. And it's to put our faith and trust in Jesus. Our salvation is not a result of our own efforts, abilities, intelligent choices, personal characteristics, or even the acts of service that we perform. Instead, it's trusting in God. That Jesus paid the penalty that I deserve and that you deserve. And eternal life is a gift from God. Those of us who are in Christ have been saved from the penalty of the law of God. But we've also been saved, this is interesting, to obey the law of God as a way of loving and worshiping the God who saved us. I started out with, we're to love our neighbors and have compassion and mercy. But we cannot do that without having first a relationship with God. And it's out of that relationship with God, it's when Christ is in us, that then we can love our neighbors. Spurgeon writes, let it never be forgotten that what the law demands of us, the gospel produces in us. We struggle to love our neighbors, but as we walk with Jesus and have them in our lives, the Holy Spirit begins to enable us be compassionate and to love others. What are you trusting in for eternal life? Are you trusting in your own efforts to satisfy God? Stop trying to justify yourself and instead humbly turn to God and ask for mercy. Only those who know God are invited to dine with him at his table. To remember that Jesus has done for us what we could never do for ourselves. And number two, if you're a believer, how's your love life? <laughs> Have you put limits on those who deserve your compassion? Jesus is calling us like the Good Samaritan to love others. Jesus says, go and do likewise. This morning before participating in communion, do you need to confess before God your, your disobedience? Repent and seek God's forgiveness. And then Jesus will say to you, welcome brothers and sisters to my table. Let's eat and remember again what I've done for you. Worship team, if you would come up here. God invites us to become a new kind of person. He wants to create in us a heart of compassion. This is exactly what Jesus died for. This is the promise of the new covenant in Ezekiel. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit will I put in you. And Jesus said at the Last Supper, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Those who follow Jesus all the way to the cross will see him there paying for their new heart.